This is Epicenter, episode 381 with guest Julien Boutlou. Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple. And if you're new to the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Today, our guest is Julien Boutlou. Now, if you're on crypto Twitter, you're probably familiar with Julien. If you're not, though, I've heard different people describe him in different ways. He's an entrepreneur, of course, but he's also been described as a crypto pirate or a DeFi Robin Hood. I think deep down, though, Julien is someone who just understands the space really well and isn't afraid to call out bullshit when it should be. Julien is the founder of Stake Capital and helped summon Stake DAO. And more recently, he launched a new project, which is more of a journalistic endeavor. It's called Wrecked. I'm sure you've seen it. It's got that cool frog logo, and it's helped uncover and kind of shed light on some kind of nefarious things happening in the DeFi ecosystem uh, since it launched a couple months ago. So this interview goes in lots of different places, and we kind of intended it to be that way, but we spent most of the time talking about DeFi. Julien is someone who knows and understands the staking ecosystem quite well, and so we spent some time talking about staking and its role in the broader DeFi ecosystem. Uh, we talked about flash loans since Julien was one of the first people to successfully execute a flash loan on Ethereum about a year ago. We discussed Oracle arbitrage and market manipulation happening around Oracles. We talked about rug pulls. We obviously couldn't help but discuss the Binance Smart Chain and NFTs. But I think more broadly, this conversation is meant to serve as a reality check. And one of the questions that we asked was, will crypto create better wealth distribution around the world? Or will it simply move centers of power from one group of people to another? Well, I'm still not sure, but this is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I'm glad that we could talk about it here on the podcast. Speaking of things that distribute wealth and provide value for the community, I'm very excited about our new sponsor, Stacker Ventures. To put it simply, Stacker Ventures is a protocol which allows for the formation, the funding, and the governance of VC funds. So they're decentralizing VC funds. They just launched and they're growing a community of crypto builders and enthusiasts, and soon they'll begin funding early stage crypto startups. I'll tell you a little bit more about them later on, but if you wanna check them out now and apply for funding, go to stacker.vc and enter your email address to request an invite. And with that, here's our conversation with Julien Boutlou. We're here today with Julien Boutlou. So Julian, you know, is quite involved with a lot of things within the crypto space, especially, you know, a lot within the Ethereum ecosystem and DeFi, but, you know, also has his hands in staking and NFTs and uh, on the team of like a, one of the largest AMM platforms. So working on all these sorts of things. And so, you know, we're excited to dive in with a lot, into a lot of it with him today. So, but, you know, maybe to get started, Julian, how, I mean, how did you get involved in crypto for the first place? Even before getting involved with crypto, I know, I know you were, you know, sort of, wor you've worked on a whole number of startups and have like, you know, even exited quite a number of them before getting into crypto. And so, you know, how did that like entrepreneurial drive like bring you towards crypto? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you for having me on the P Center. I've been following the, the podcast for quite some years now. Uh, congratulations, guys, on the, on the building this uh, uh, it's so big and, and very, uh, very good quality. Yeah, so basically my background, my background is uh, computer science uh, and uh, electrical engineering. I start uh, as very deep into mathematics in France. So we, we call this uh, like um, a two year specialization, really um, deep in mathematics. And then I moved to the US and I got um, specialized in master in uh, machine learning, distributed system, nothing to do with crypto, but I then start working for security defense company and in security defense company, I was pretty healthy in, in CS. So the counter strike game. And one of my friends, I was running some computers to do uh, fires hosting 
um, back then. And in 2011, one of my friends told me to run this algorithm and, and later on appeared to be uh, a Bitcoin. So then I got involved in, in Mongox and, and all these different things. And uh, when I went back to, to, to London, I uh, discovered Ether. So like in 2015. So yeah, I mean, my, my background was I built different companies. Um, like start playing carpet it was like for satellite gathering data from from space uh, building some machine learning that can predict the future of physical assets for example life production of coffee in brazil or carbon offset also did um, uh, some consulting company in london for uh, machine learning work for biggest companies over there um, so i guess my entrepreneurial path was always driving by trying to build some uh, innovative ideas some of them failed and some of them and got successful. Um, but, um, yeah, that's it. So really, really tech guy came from the countryside of France and then moved to the U.S. And I guess that's how I, I got this vibe of the, a little bit of the uh, American dream, I guess. I'm not sure. I've always kind of thought you had a very interesting, uh, uh, parcours, as we would say in France or a background, uh, because like you're, you're one of these people that, and, you know, there's a few, there's a few people like this, right. That like they leave France like super early in their life. Like, you know, like I think you must've left France, like when you were in your early twenties or something like that. And like, you just went to the U S is that right? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's cutting a little bit the signal, but, um, I lived France right after my uh, class preparatoire mathematics. So I went to the U S graduate from, uh, uh, in New York State from a school called uh, Union, uh, which is like in, probably in the worst place to live in the U.S. in Schenectady, like uh, upstate New York, <laughs> above Albany. <laughs> I think like at most American, they don't actually go after Albany, but this was my first. I mean, actually, it was my second second experience in the U.S. because two years before, three years to that experience, moving to the U.S., I actually lived in, uh, in California. But so I can tell you, like moving from California to upstate New York in Schenectady, it's a it's a pretty rough experience. But I think that's how I, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was pretty amazing. No, that's really cool. I think there's lots of different ways that people qualify you. I actually like I, I was talking, I was asking someone uh, here in the French ecosystem, uh, whom you may know. It's like, oh, I'm gonna interview Julia tomorrow. Like, what do you think I should ask him? And and he was like, oh, the crypto pirate. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's another uh, another way that people describe uh, Julien, I guess. Uh, so how would you sort of describe yourself in this space? I think like some people would say you're like a trader, a crypto pirate. Uh, you know, now you're some sort of a journalist. You've got a, a you know, you're, you're involved in like a hedge fund. Like we were talking earlier that you sometimes describe yourself as like the crypto Robin Hood. <laughs> you know, what's your, what's your elevator pitch essentially for how you describe yourself? <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure actually. Like, um, I mean, my background is really mathematics and also uh, quant, quantitative trading. So I understand, I understand maths pretty well. So I can, I can build uh, script and algorithms. So I can actually, and I think for me, quantitative trading is passion. Uh, like from traditional finance, when I was in in London uh, working in in that traditional finance, I think my age. I couldn't actually get experience of uh, traditional finance during the, the 90s, you know, when there was no regulation and it was pretty, pretty much like wild, wild west and what everything was possible. So for me, like seeing at DeFi and understanding mathematics, understanding like uh, DevOps and all this stuff, you can basically do whatever you want. And that's pretty passion, uh, uh, fascinating. I would probably consider myself as, yeah, a DeFi, DeFi builder. I try to build. Uh, any ideas that I have in the morning when I wake up, I, I would like. I want to. I want to build them. I like the DeFi pirates, and I'm not sure about DeFi. I mean, DeFi Robin Hood. The problem is like I also do a lot of liquidation, so people will probably take this one as not uh, a good status to my to attach to to myself probably. What's the? Uh, I mean, uh, I, I find this fascinating. I, I'm I'm very envious of people who are able to kind of successfully ex execute on many different projects as one, at once, because this is something I have a hard time to do. H how do you manage to be involved in all these different things, which we'll talk about today, and and at the same time, sort of like keep your bearings on your more longer term vision and goals? Yeah, I think if you if you talk to most of people, they, they usually tend to say, oh, I don't sleep much. But actually, I fucking don't sleep. Very, like, I don't sleep. Like, I actually don't sleep. I, I sleep like two, three hours a night. 
And um, apparently I'm, I'm part of this uh, range of population that can sleep. I think it's like 0.1% or something that can actually sleep not much. So, and, and I spend most of my time in front of the laptop. So I have to use those hours and that's how I do that. And I like to also um, get some really, all the people that get involved, I, I know them personally, but I think they're very good. So I couldn't do what I'm doing without people around me that can execute uh, execute those ideas. Because I think an idea is having an idea is pretty easy. You know, it's probably like eight eight or ten percent of project. But being able to execute that idea like very fast and very well, and also by simplicity. If you look at all the projects that have been involved, they always respect a few different pillars, and those are. I don't, I don't care about UX, UI. I just do black and white. Most of my projects are black and white. They don't actually shield anything and just go to simplicity. And that's the reason also why I'm, um, I was like pretty, um, well, when I met, uh, Michael and Curve, because it's also like part of the DNA of Curve. It's like simplicity on the design and not into some very fancy UX or UI. And so what are some of the um, these initiatives that you're working on right now? So, you know, there's the one that you mentioned that there was Curve. Uh, you have the blog that you are working on, Rekt. You have There's the company you have called State Capital. Uh, what, what, what are also some of the stuff you're actually working on these days? Yeah, so back in 2000, I think it was 2017, during the ICO boom, I, I found out, I mean, I'm not found out, but I saw the space moving into proof of stake. And I think I remember like Sunny, this is where we met uh, back then. I think it was 2016, 2017, 2017 probably. But then I was like, oh shit, this space is moving for proof of work. So I had experience in mining in Bitcoin and mining in, in uh, Ethereum. And I was like, okay, I have, I've, I've got some assets and I need to find someone, a provider that can provide validation for my assets. And this one, the first one was Tezos. So I, I said, okay, well, let me find someone. And I found out that the space was pretty, like I was actually starting on a proof of stake validation. So I said, okay, why not providing proof of stake for my own, my own assets? That's how I started stake capital. So stake capital was validating on Tezos. We made acquisition of a Tezos baker called hot stake back then. And, and then we actually start the, the staking as a service, uh, staff made a partnership with Equinix bare metal server in, in AWS, like really not like just getting credits, actually like real partnership with those guys. And then I said, Okay, we're not opening to the retail side. That's how we did. Now we open to retail, got to participate in game of stake on Cosmos, get ourselves a little bit more knowledgeable about the proof of stake. And then in 2018, wrote this uh, light paper from Stake Capital, which is what uh, Stake Capital uh, DAO. And the idea was to basically create those liquid staking because knowing that those different blockchains will come on, will come live, then you will need to be able to lock your phone, but also maybe use those bridges, either using IBC or using like a other, other mechanism. That's how we start. And then I was like pretty, pretty solid in this kind of DevOps environment, like being able to monitor the main pool at sub 50 milliseconds across the world, like load balancers, centuries, and all different things. That was basically being able to do arbitrage on the market of DeFi. And then when DeFi boomed, I say, oh wow, sticking to the service is not actually so big compared to what uh, DeFi can can uh, can bring on a table. So I actually like moved 20% of the stake capital services into staking as a service as a passive income, and then bootstrap and got really big in those different verticals as market maker, liquidity provider, arbitrage, and then create the first flash loan because I was talking to Ave, I was talking to that, and the concept of having access to unlimited liquidity as long as we the liquidity within one block was passionate, it was like so fascinating for me. So I, I, I spent like a couple of weeks working on that um, and then uh, and then did the first one and then triggered all this kind of new phase of DeFi where you could do like all this kind of uh, flash loan and, 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 and then test all those different protocols. So that's how I... And then, yeah, so... So this is like state capital moving. Then I was like, people asking me a question. How do you, how can I participate in state capital? I was like, well, you can run this command line, uh, use the terminal. But they were like, yeah, but where do I, how can I stake? I wanted something like Binance. I wanted something like true uh, trust wallet. I was like, oh shit. Uh, so then I create, I start creating this small script for people that they can actually just by a Telegram group, then get updates of their stake. But this was not enough. That was not enough for my my mom or my dad to get involved and just like participate so that's how i start 
uh, working on stake down. And the reason why I started working on stake down is not just me building stake down. It's because I found someone that was like such a rock star in uh, Web two development that you could actually bring that experience to me on the on the side of of the blockchain. And this combination was really fast to create stake down. So stake down is in a place for anyone that has no crypto experience that can invest in the space. But we involved like more than 6,000 people that had no experience in DeFi, which is pretty crazy in this space. Uh, but you can do everything. You can buy crypto, you can swap, you can exchange, you can stake. Uh, and also like we have, we're now building stake down V2. Remember in 2017, I told you that I wrote when there was the ICO, instead of building an ICO myself and jumping into the free cash, I actually created this medium post where I was going after all the ICO possible and I was saying that I was basically um, warning people that those ICO were scams. Well, what happened to me, I got sued. I got sued for quite a lot of money, 3.5 million US dollars. And they sued me because I, I was having like some uh, defamatory. Uh, I was basically calling them scammers on, on Telegram, but then explaining why. So this was pretty bad experience for me. For two or three years, it was pretty bad. And then... I always wanted to create this kind of newsletter to alarm, uh, not alarm, but to warn people about what's happening in the space. And that's how it came up with the concept of REC. But also, the reason why I started REC is not because I wanted to start REC, because I tried to start it and I failed because I got sued. No, because I met someone that can actually draft and write very well. And this is actually this combination that, again, bootstrap this project. Uh, so it's always about people, not about like a single end. In a space, if you see someone building a lot of different projects, it means that he's actually doing with multiple different people. Don't believe that he's doing this alone. So that's why I started Rekt. And now Rekt is just like going like really deep in, into investigations. Like we do like dark mode. So we don't actually name the people behind the news. Never, no names and, and mm -hmm. all the source possible. Whatever happened on chain will be covered by Rekt. Expect Rekt to not. We've been receiving a lot of lobby for news to not get listed on Rekt, when we get those, it's actually the opposite. We got, <laughs> we got full mod and we, we list them. And um, yeah, that's it. And then a year ago, I was pretty involved in, I, I like the game Sorare because for the record, I'm, I'm an investor in Sorare and it's a French, it's a French company and I quite like those guys. So I said, I will invest with those guys. But the problem is like, I got no time. So I said, how can I participate in the game but I have no time and you need to play like 24 hours in this game. So then I have to start getting someone and paying someone to play with my portfolio of NFTs and play the game. And I was like, oh, damn. I see like Axie Infinity, Decentraland, Crypto, Voxel, all those different NFT companies. You need 24 hours, seven days a week to work on those different projects. So then I said, okay, let's start a hedge fund that will basically lend asset liquidity to those people the best managers in the place that can participate. And that's how we create Blackpool. And now it's pretty successful. That's a quick, uh, <laughs> quick journey to my life. Stacker Ventures just recently launched. They're a community-led venture capital protocol and accelerator. And they're looking for exciting DeFi projects for the first fund. It's the first of its kind. It's structured as a DAO. And Stacker Ventures allows anyone to participate in the governance of the protocol and the acceleration of portfolio companies. Stack governance tokens will be distributed to early participants in the protocol soon through a variety of participation incentives. The first fund to leverage the Stacker Ventures framework recently launched, and they're now looking for exciting DeFi projects to apply for funding. So if you'd like to apply, or if you want to refer a project, or just earn stack governance tokens by helping accelerate projects, you can view the first fund details at stacker.vc. And here you just need to enter your email address to request an invite. We'd like to thank Stacker Ventures for their support of the podcast. So, you know, let's talk about the uh, stake DAO that you you brought up. So, you know, I, I, I played around on the uh, platform. It's, you know, it's pretty nice and it's a pretty powerful like DeFi dashboard. Um, but, you know, there are like other DeFi dashboards that are available as well. Like, you know, we have like things like Zapperfy and things like that. One of the interesting things about StakeDAO is that, you know, it is tokenized in some way, which is, you know, something that like Zapper, for example, is not. So, and, you know, obviously in the name, it has the word DAO in it. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about like, what is the token for here? And what what is the purpose of having a DAO behind a dashboard? I mean, I'm a big fan of Zapper. I'm a big fan of Zerion. 
but Stake DAO is really not like Zapier's Zion. The thing is like Zapier's Zion, they give you access to DeFi. Well, Stake DAO give you access to the services that we choose for you that we believe are the best as features for you to participate. So it's very different. And also all the profits, all the different services that we have on Stake DAO are redistributed to the people that uh, have the Stake DAO token. So meaning that we don't take profits. The reason then people are saying the second question is, but how do you make money? Well, the reason is because we all have shares in Stake DAO. And also, Stake DAO has no investors. We're all contributors. So if you go to the page of contributors, you will see like a list of 60 or 70 people that have been participating uh, to build uh, Stake DAO. And then basically the DAO, you can make all the votes governance possible. If you want to list like a new chain, for example, Binance, Binance chain, the, the thing is like, do we agree that Binance is decentralized and not decentralized? That's not the question. If someone make a proposal on Stake DAO and the, the token holders, they vote for implementing um, Binance chain as a swap or as an auto market maker on Stake DAO, then we'll have to do it. So basically the token control any decisions that we make on the, on the, on the DAO. So for example, we have different strategies. Uh, we'll have also arbitrage, arbitrage strategy, flash loan strategy, and whatever money we make inside will be distributed to a vote and anyone staking stake DAO token will be able to take a fractional ownership of those different profits. So stake DAO will also become this sort of like multi-chain uh, dashboard as well, like not just focus on the mainnet Ethereum, but so as like if DeFi starts to move into other chains, like you mentioned with like Binance chain or, you know, if it moves into, I don't know, Phantom or XDAI, it'll start or these are all like EVM compatible chains. Will you also be focused on non EVM compatible chains as well? Or how do you see the evolution of that happening? So the evolution is like right now, um, the DAO is live on Ethereum, but um, we do, we do multi chain. So if you take a look to the 2017 paper, light paper about stake capital, it described like having the ability to get involved in all the different chains and also any provider can propose their service. So we welcome any validators to validate and provide the services for stake down. And also if we will basically, the idea is to have like liquid staking and swaps. So liquid staking for people that can stake and they can also sell the, the fractional ownership of this um, uh, liquid staking that they have into secondary market and also bridges. So as a user, a simple scenario is I want to be able to swap between Binance to Tezos to Polkadot to Cosmos or whatever if it's possible and if it's live. And this actually capture liquidity and volumes and obviously fees for the DAO. So we moved moving into a multi chain uh, DeFi society. So we need to capture those different um, different uh, opportunities. So let's maybe start go deeper into this and like into this like state of DeFi today. So how how do you see this uh what DeFi is going to look like now like one year from now? So like today, you know, it's very clear that like the maj vast majority of DeFi is happening on Ethereum. Like you mentioned earlier, you are you're an ETH maximalist uh right now. Uh how do you see this evolving, you know, especially with like the you, you know, gas costs and stuff today that are uh, on Ethereum? Is is it pushing out the you, the retail user, you know, the, the, the users that staked out was initially uh, designed for, is it starting to to price those sort of users out? Yeah, that's a good question. That's the reason why staked out V2 will be focused on, um, well, the thing is like, when we staked out V2 will be more, like more concept of a decentralized exchange, if I can say that without telling much, but basically, right now participating and swiping and buying assets and stake down quite costly. Um, it's quite expensive. But any any DeFi, if you go to Curve, if you go like to any project, you easily spend 50 bucks for for just depositing uh, assets. So I think the fact that blockchain is becoming more uh, democratized and pushed by big pseudo experts and influencers in the space, like maybe Rihanna or like people that have always been in tech apparently. Obviously people now have access to, uh, they, they they believe or they don't actually see crypto as, as something dangerous anymore. 
So my point is like, now they actually, we bring more people into blockchain, into crypto, but those retail people, 99% of all the users are not, not tech. They are Instagrammers. They are uh, people using TikTok and all this stuff. So they want like something super simple. And they actually, frankly speaking, they don't actually care about decentralization. They just want to make money. And that's the problem of this world space. So the reason why I believe, how do you see like DeFi in the next year? It's actually DeFi will be, will be actually controlled by centralized entity that are pretending to run DeFi solution or maybe getting involved in blockchain. And one of them, one of the biggest player and actually really likely to succeed is Binance because Binance, they understand that their retail, their users, don't actually care about decentralization. They care about having fun with money. They want to make money. They want to make investment. So the real question is, are we feeling as a decentralized vision compared to people that only focus on money? And I think Binance, Phantom, all those different chains that actually are centralized. Uh, Phantom is centralized. Uh, Binance is centralized. Like all those different things, they will start a centralized entity, capture a lot of retail, and then slowly but surely move into decentralization by bringing more validators. And I think that's a sneaky move from them because they will, they are, they are very likely to succeed. And yeah, that's, that's the point. I mean, that's the reason why I think it's basically putting the agenda of Ethereum uh, a little bit earlier that, I mean, now Ethereum cannot play, oh, it's coming soon or it's coming in two years. I mean, soon Ethereum, when they say like it's soon, it means like four or five years, you know, this cannot continue. So I think it's really pushing Ethereum people to uh, to really deliver. But my point being is like, if you look at all the research, I think 98 or 99% of the entire research is driving by Ethereum right now. If you go to ETH, uh, research.ch and all the stuff, the entire developers, research, mathematician, um, like uh, really deep in computer science are all on Ethereum. That's pretty funny. That's the reason because it's easy to copy stuff, but then, Innov- um, innovate it's probably it's, it's, it's tougher just so i understand correctly you think the strategy for chains like binance is that they start centralized and then they will decentralize later that did i understand that correctly yeah it's already it's already happening if you read the latest article on wrecked um, binance uh, chain um they're basically talking about it and we also had like some very internal uh, discussion uh from people uh from uh, binance that now they're looking to get I'm sure, Sunny, you got in touch with uh, Binance lately, but now they're looking for validators uh, and they're looking to, instead of adding 10 or 15, I don't know, like 10, 15 validators, they probably, they're now looking for 80, like more than uh, uh, more validators. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, um, businessly, if you, if you, if we talk about business, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good move. That's a good move. But then if we talk about, is it fair and all this stuff? It's not, obviously. I mean, well, I, I, I mean, just think, from, if I take the devil's advocate position here, like, if the outcome is that the chain is decentralized and there is no central point of failure, uh, you know, in what it would be like Binance otherwise in a central system, and and that succeeds, then how is that not a good strategy? Just generally, how I mean, but how does it not benefit not the ideals of, of uh, decentralization? Well, I mean, it's um, it's like you know, like Team, the English guy saying. Uh, create the internet peer to peer. The vision was peer to peer was this fully decentralized world. But then big Yahoo, Google, and all those guys, they start centralized, centralizing internet and then giving bridges to people. And then huge, huge lobby like those guys, they start saying the dark net is bad. You should use our bridges because the real internet, the 1% that we provide is the real internet. Well, actually the real internet is 99% of the rest, which is the dark net. But then lobby was so strong to tell you that dark net is used to kill people, to pedophile for all this stuff. Yeah, you have like very, very bad actors on the, on the dark net, but actually this is a real internet. But we were, uh, we were born in this belief that the real internet is the internet we can use. And now if you look at all those big actors like Facebook, Google, Yahoo, and all those guys, Okay, they actually provide uh, the sharing economy. Like you have Airbnb, you have Uber, you have Blablaka. But then this, those guys, they control the entire system. So my point is like, they, we were starting as a decentralized economy, as a peer-to-peer economy, then controlled by centralized entity that now control the entire world. Well, I feel like we're basically replicating it uh, again. We're saying, okay, it's fine if those guys, they copy six years of research, five years of research because it's open source, build their own stuff, acquire a lot of retail, acquire a lot of power 
And then those retailers, they will never leave the platform because they are actually inside the system and they will never make the bridge between changing. For example, like if you're an iPhone user, changing to a Google user is very difficult or a Google user to going to an iPhone one. It's like, it's a mind fuck total because they don't actually give you the tools to do so. So what's happening is exactly the same. We're starting as a central, they're starting as a centralized entity, getting a lot of power on the market. And then soon they will say, oh, but listen, look, we share the same vision as you guys. We have a decentralized system that you guys can use and you can be your own bank. You can be your own company and that's it. So, I mean, it's a fair, it's a fair game. They're playing. I mean, it's not new. Traditional finance. Um, if you look at Facebook, Facebook got copied in Russia, in Asia. They all have their own Facebook. They all have their own Uber. They all have their own Airbnb. So it's not new. It's just the way it's actually made, trying to trick their users into the belief that they are in control of their own keys and all this stuff. I think this is different, different uh, picture now. I hear that argument. And I, I think it's, it's a super important thing uh, to consider as like, you know, if we think of like the long-term vision of crypto. And I've been thinking a lot about this recently. Are you familiar with uh, Ben Thompson and Stratechery? He's a like very you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right yeah. famous tech writer and he has a newsletter, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And he writes about this, um, you know, he's been writing for years about this theory of aggregation or aggregation theory. And this theory states that like, Basically, businesses on the internet tends toward aggregation because of network effects and because of just the potential for economies of scale and like low marginal cost uh, scale. And you know, this is of course like it's it's counter to the to the prevailing narratives in crypto that we need to have everything decentralized. But what we see happening is that things end up even in crypto sort of being centralized. And like Binance is one example, but it's not the only example. Do you think that there's a risk that? crypto and this this idea of full decentralization just isn't attainable if things begin to scale at a global level i mean if there are you know a billion users on ethereum or like you know 3 billion people using crypto is it even reasonable to think that um, there can be scalable systems that are fully decentralized that have that many people on them yeah it's a, it's a good question i mean uh, Bitcoin, 2009, Ethereum, 2014, it's already seven years old. If you look at the research, people are saying, oh, but look, Polkadot or, I don't know, like uh, New Shane, um, they are faster and they are much, they are well, well more designed. But I mean, people t- 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 tend to forget that those actually Ethereum technology is really old, meaning that obviously back then there was a revolution, but now moving and migrating an entire market cap of, I don't even know, like maybe 250 billion is very difficult into this kind of system of proof of stake, fully, fully decentralized mechanism that is not, that is not going into, 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 um, from, from mining and, and miners and all that stuff. I'm not sure if it's actually a risk because if we really believe in this, uh, that we're building the false revolution, which is a system where it's fully decentralized, I think people will have no, the thing is like now compared to the, I mean, the previous revolution, I call it like a sharing economy and the, the one before is internet. But now actually it's different because before in order to do something, you had to ask regulation or ask companies that if you could build using the API, build using the SDK or build a like, connect to Facebook login and all stuff, you had to ask questions. Well, here, if people don't start using decentralization, they will be isolated inside their own market. You don't want this. So now it's not like for business reason that they are, um, I mean, it's not like they're not forced to do it. I mean, forced to do it like from someone on the top, from regulation, because regulation doesn't want this before. Now it's actually forced from the bottom. If you don't actually integrate and, and then, and then go decentralized, you will be not, you will not be able to have access to those, uh, huge market. We're not talking about usually we say, Oh, as a new company, traditional uh, company, I want to go to the American market because we're talking to 400 million users and the mar- American users, they like to spend money and it's, it's really fast. And then we're going to need to go to Asia. China is the other place because they go fast in spending money. Well, here it's blockchain. If you don't actually get involved in blockchain and decentralization, then you will lose three billions of people that can, uh, that can use your product and make money and you can capture fees. So I think we are. Uh, aiming for decentralization, but right now the right move for those business, if you're running a business, is what people are doing. They actually centralized the, the the thing, 
capture a lot of liquidity very quick, capture a lot of users very quick, and then slowly but surely will decentralize and then buy what? By forking and cloning projects that are already super successful on Ethereum. I, I think I agree with part of that. But at the same time, I wonder to what extent like there are forces that there are sort of like external forces that could you know, shape the way or like shape the direction in which the space goes. So like one of those forces is, I guess, like forces that are just inherent yeah. to the way technology works. So like this aggregation theory thing, I think like, you know, yeah, well, if that is correct, that's one force. And then the other is regulation. So for example, like you're, you're well aware that there is the Mika proposal in Europe and that, you know, in his current writing, it, it might just put the US immediately in the driver's seat because like, U.S. banks are able to issue stable coins and European banks aren't. And so I, I wonder to what extent there's just so many other, I, I don't want to sound pessimistic here, but I do like recently I've had some, some sort of existential questions about like crypto and whether, you know, it is really in the hands of those that are building, you know, the Ethereum chain, for example, like those working on, the, on that research and like those really driving the, ideo the ideologies if it's really in their hands about what actually happens and how yeah. the space actually like evolves into you know, whatever it is going to evolve in. Yeah, no, it's a good point, man. But that's exactly, that's actually what you just said. Um, it, it's a perfect recap of the situation compared to all the previous revolution. It's always companies going against people. Where right now we're actually seeing companies trying to be the people, but then nation states trying to regulate what people as a company doing. So I think one of the biggest as European or like, I see like three different major forces, obviously like uh, US, Europe and, and Asia. As soon as one of them is being able to worldwide print or tokenize their national currency, the race will be for those DeFi products of blockchain to actually start using them. And obviously US is already leading this because they already have like Gemini uh, coming with the two, two the, the twins. Um, they are like uh, Coinbase and all these different things. But if you actually look, that's a, that's a good point is, okay, it's decentralized. But what is actually truly decentralized? Because at any point of time, it's already already happened. Fully decentralization is normally a hack happen. The person gets the money. And normally the, the people that if you have fully control, which is basically the vision of blockchain, you have fully control of your assets and you can do whatever you want. I'm not actually posing the question, is it bad, hack, exploit, or arbitrage? But normally the person should be able to use the money as he wants. But right now what we're seeing is like big company like USDT, they say, okay, the next day, oh, the, the CEO, I think this is a CTO, always go on Twitter and say, oh, I'm very glad people, I post the money from these hackers because these hackers, these hackers stole the money from this uh, very legitimate company. I'm, I'm like, yeah, okay, that's good because maybe this is an exploit, this is a hacking. But at the same time, it's against the vision of, of decentralization because normally you have fully control of your assets. So yeah, big comp. And that's the reason why I think Curve, the finance, probably one of the biggest and major project in DeFi. If you actually look at, if you, if you like the game Risk, Risk, you play nation and you nation against nations. And here, if you believe that the crypto will be uh, is part of evolution, this fourth revolution, then every country in the world, major countries in the world, would like to have their nation, their uh, national currency tokenized. And then as soon as what happened is like, they will want people to swap uh, between different, uh, different uh, uh, stable coins. And what happened is uh, right now, one of the best place that you can, apparently they're saying like 50 or 60%, that's probably something I heard, but uh, maybe it's all bullshit. Uh, 50 or 60% of the entire market of crypto will be stable coins because the underlying asset of value worldwide is currencies. The FX market is doing six trillions volume a day. So the goal of project like curve of finance, which is like focus on stable coins and let's basically see that as an FX market. Even if curve capture 1% or 2% of what's the future of, of of uh, FX is, 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 then it will be like uh, uh, making billions of volume per day. Well, my point is mm -hmm. right now the real competition and centralization of power is on stablecoin. People are chasing yeah. governments and national state to print the national currency, not just because it's cool. It's because when you can print money and distribute your money, you are in control of the world. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I, I definitely agree with you. I mean, I've always been, I've been a believer that like stable coins are going to be what takes over most of crypto because uh, I think that's what most average people want to be used. And they, they want to use DeFi, but they probably want to use it with their like stable units of asset, not with like crypto, uh, like Bitcoin or Ethereum necessarily. So, I mean, we mentioned uh, the, the you know, regulations and, I you know, you, you, you briefly mentioned this like arbitrage stuff. Um do you think like, you know, so like kind of to move into like some of, some of the DeFi topics we wanted to cover, you know, one of the most common attacks that's been happening within the DeFi ecosystem, it feels like now, nowadays it feels like it's happening on like a weekly basis is usually the sort of uh, price arbitrage attacks where people will use flash loans, um, which, you know, we can talk about as well. But, um, you know, to do like some sort of Oracle manipulation attacks, as like a lot of things are depending on these on chain exchanges as an Oracle, and then they're like, you know, using these ex these things to exploit and like, take steal value from the system, be be things that are relying on maybe, you know, maybe they shouldn't be relying on these poor Oracles in the first place. But, you know, in, in, in traditional finance, these sort of attacks are like, you know, illegal and they'd be considered like in the realm of market manipulation. Um, do you think that like this, the, how do you think this crypto ecosystem will have to evolve to, you know, clearly this is not something that's acceptable in the long term. And so how, how do you think the crypto ecosystem will have to grow to evolve here? Yeah, so, yeah, I think it's got a, a lot of discussion and a lot of um, people saying that what's happening in DeFi and 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 flash loans uh, it, it, it tends, I mean, tend to be not acceptable in the sense that people um, um, are getting getting hacked or they lose money and whatever. But I think like uh, let's get back to uh, for a sec to flash loans. I mean, flash loans mm -hmm. are nothing new if you compare it to traditional market. In traditional market, they're not called flash loan. But they call whales, like big fancy, big VC, venture business capital, hedge fund, and especially banks or insurance that have the capacity to go on the market and to take massive position, like the thing that we saw in in Gamestonk. You know, Gamestonk people um, then um, buying a long position, and then all the Reddit users going there and then trying to short. Uh, the uh, the big VC in in, in New York in, in Wall Street. Uh, the thing is, like those be those behaviors already exist in traditional finance. What is actually pretty yeah. mind mind blowing in decentralized finance is those different behaviors can be triggered by people that have not a single pain, penny in their pocket. So meaning right. that it's like saying in traditional finance, like saying, okay, wait, people can actually go big on the market. So we need to stop banks, insurance, uh, venture business capital, and hedge fund to actually uh, uh, interact with finance. No, it's not possible. The reason and the only reason why decentralized finance, like traditional finance, exist is like in the 90s and 2000s, you had people taking arbitrage. People don't actually understand that if you're doing arbitrage, if you're making money with flash loan, if you're making money with liquidation, this is the only reason why such a system exists is because you have actors that make sure that if you take in an under, under collateralized loan. I'm not like uh, criticizing flash loans. I think flash loans are like really great. I think like flash loans get this like weird rap. Like, uh, like I, I, you know, I, I was actually one of the first people, I, you know, I wrote a blog post about flash loans back in like 2017. Uh, I, I, I always been a big fan of flash loans. I'm talking about more about like the different uses of flash loans. So I think there's some very good uses of of like how people are using flash loans. So, you know, when you have more efficient liquidations, more uh, like better arbitrage. The, my question is more about like, I don't even want to focus on the flash loan part. You know, the flash loan is, it's a tool that people are using, but you're right. Even if there's no flash loans, whales could still be doing this. But I, what I'm talking about is like this level of like, market manipulation that happens and oracle manipulation this would be illegal in like traditional finance or like at least you know the goal is that we should try to like prevent this kind of behaviors from happening and so at least in traditional finance we do have this tool of regulation how well the regulators do their job at preventing this in traditional finance you know we can debate about that but like 
in DeFi, how do we build, you know, we don't, we can't rely on regulation to come save us here, or maybe we can, I don't know. But like, if not, how do we create a safe ecosystem where like the De the protocols that we're depending on are resilient against these sort of manipulation attacks? I completely agree with you. The difference is decentralized finance compared to traditional finance is decentralized. I mean, that's part of the name. So my point is, if you compare what's happening in decentralized finance, you're saying, oh, this will be not acceptable and will be punished in traditional finance. Well, the reason why we have them in, in, in decentralized finance is because the system that are being built are not correctly built. That's it. And that's, that's the reason why flash loans or any other way of, of manipulating oracles and all the stuff, uh, if they are possible, it means that the protocol needs to change. Because if you're building something that can be not exploited, but can be armed by a huge liquidity, then it means that your system that you've built is bad because it's a trustless right. mechanism. Anyone can enter, anyone can exit. So if you're not building a system that is mathematically bulletproof, mathematically bulletproof, but also a crypto economics, like game theory, then it means that your system shouldn't be in, in tradition in, and defined, but actually should be in traditional finance. If you just copy traditional finance and bring them into decentralized finance without actually thinking outside the box, then you get exploited right. and you get hacked. But I think like most of them in decentralized finance, whatever we covered in REC, I don't think people agree with me, but I think most of them are arbitrage. They're not exploits. They just, mm -hmm. they build a system and people use the system. They build a system for people to arms and make money, but those people were smaller and they actually make bigger money. But at the end of the day, they're just right. arbitrage. I mean, not all of them, but most of them, yes. So, so right. Okay. So, so, so your take here is that like, these systems themselves are like poorly designed and like performing these like arbitrages and like this is how we like the system will be forced to evolve in order to de design better and better, more resilient systems, essentially. Yeah, exactly. The reason why your money is safe at the bank is not because the bank is saying the money is safe. It's because you add robbers trying to steal into the bank, you know? I mean, don't trust verify. It's the same in traditional finance. If a system is fully secured, you need to, they need to show you that this system was trying to get a, a hack by millions of people. And then you can say it's secure. It's not secure by design. It's secure by being in practice on chain and being like the reason why Bitcoin is secure is because if it wasn't secure, Bitcoin is like a trillion market cap. Then people were just mm -hmm. like, it's Bitcoin right now is the biggest holy grail of money uh, part. Like the biggest bounty on earth is Bitcoin. And if someone tells you it's not yeah. secure, I'm like, okay, cool. Go there and hack it and take the money. <laughs> the reason why it's secure is because the money is not being hacked. It's the same in DeFi. Mm -hmm. The reason why DeFi is solid, and if you tell DeFi is more solid than traditional finance, then your protocol shouldn't be easily manipulated by providing liquidity in such a way or another. But obviously, it's more complicated to, to defend. But if we actually, I'm, I'm sure like in the future, in the next couple of years, it will be impossible to, to manipulate those different networks internally to the project because it will be a black box. But then the, the next level will be cross chains because what will happen actually, I mean, like trillions and trillions of years uh, of dollars and then getting like arbitrage, bridges, parachain, like all these different things. Wow, this is pretty fascinating. So, you know, you mentioned that you're also one of the, uh, you know, team members of the Curve uh, finance. And so how do you see like curve, like, you know, helping push this, the ecosystem towards building those, these more resilient, uh, DeFi protocols? Well, right now, if you're looking for huge liquidity, like actually zero employment loss and, and zero slippage, if you're good enough, then you can use such a system. Um, curve provide you a place for being able to swap huge amount of liquidity that something that was never able to do in traditional finance. For example, like one of the feature that a curve made is you can swap 45, 40, 25 million US dollars, depending on debt of, uh, of synthetics, but you can swap huge amount of money from East to BTC. And then we use some virtual, like, uh, the project synthetics to basically allow this swap and then use, you have a settlement. So during this settlement, in order to wait, then we issue an NFT that represent 
your settlement. And as soon as the settlement um, goes on chain, then you can you can claim uh, your funds. But my point, I think that was a before this tool and after this tool in DeFi. The reason for that is like if you do such, if you want to do such a um, such a thing in traditional finance, you will need to sign documents. You will need to wait like a couple months and sign what we call in uh, MC multi collateral party MCP. And this will take will take long, will take a lot of money. You will take lawyers, you will take like middle middleman. Well, here you can do that in just a couple of minutes and zero slippage. I mean, you just pay a fee. So one my point is like curve becoming like the underlying protocol on Ethereum, but also like cross chains soon and working on um, integrating in multiple different chains. But it's the under underlying protocol. If you want to do, for example, like imagine users on Coinbase or users on Binance or like stuff like that. I don't see those guys not implementing Curve as the underlying uh, protocol and maybe charge a little fee because right now it's the best protocol if you want to do a swap. And huge volume, like solid technology and entirely focused on security. It can be shocking for people to look at the UI, but that's, the, that's a different discussion. <laughs> yeah, you, you were talking earlier about how simple the UI was. And I, I actually look at the UI, I'm like, I, I see what they're doing here. I know the aesthetic they're looking for, but I don't find it very simple. <laughs> yeah, we're working on the UI v2, but yeah, I can I can understand that might be a little bit too much for some users. Yeah. So I'm curious, you mentioned NFTs here. If you think NFTs will play, I mean, like a lot of the attention of NFTs has been around collectibles and like, you know, you, you talked about SoRare earlier and, and, and all these different uh, collectibles projects. How how much do you think NXTs will play a role in in tokenizing like debt instruments and contracts and things like this? Do you think that this that this trend that, yeah. you're, that you're seeing here on Curve that, will, will continue to grow? Yeah, I think that the, the biggest value in NFTs are not, I mean, gaming, like uh, verticals of, of diver, um, like gaming, porn and all these different things are huge verticals. But I think like if you really do the NFT market, is actually into a finance. So if you do like uh, tokenized debt, um, real estate, um, like all those different things, I think this is where the NFTs can actually, you can tokenize a contract and then send the contract to someone. You can trace the contract. You can also like, like for people in the, in a supply chain or like items, like this is huge. I think that the real value in NFT are in, in this kind of, of services right now. Um, the democratization of those NFTs happens on the, uh, on the on the gaming side and collectible and arts, uh, they are good. I mean, art the art market is a trillion market cap worldwide. But I've seen traditional finance; uh, it's trillions and trillions. So, um, yeah, NFT market will be pretty huge. And if we if you look at the curve synthetic swap and you understand the mechanism of using this NFT that uh, represent a time between the settlement happen on chain and you're able to redeem it and or you can actually send it, then it's a, it's a it's it's a complete game changer. I feel like last year with Flash Loan, people start using Flash Loan a little bit and then it became super big and people start talking about it. Well actually I think what Curve did with this mechanism of a swap, being able to swap millions, even even bigger centralized exchange like a BitMEX or Binance or, or FTX, they cannot do that. You cannot swap a 45 million US dollars on the platform without actually getting a huge slip edge or creating a huge dam from the market. That's not possible. Well, except maybe Kraken, but Kraken does actually fuck up the entire market in one shot. So, You guys had on Rekt, you had a post recently talking about the creation of decentralized monopolies within the space. And like, so, you know, there's been this string of, you know, mergers and acquisitions between DeFi protocols and it's it's a little bit unclear what these even mean but do you think that like there is this growing amount of centralization of soft power within the space especially as like you know we, we see this rise of like governance tokens but it seems that oftentimes these governance tokens have very little actual governing power and like instead we see a lot of the soft power in the space like accrue to like some of the developers and development teams like Andre and stuff where like they they are somewhat unaccountable to the communities themselves do you see this becoming a risk within the ecosystem over time 
I think this is one of the bigger, bigger subjects in blockchain is, as, as you mentioned before, is like, are we going into this kind of like replicate? I mean, what we're building, for example, in Rect, we have this uh, subject called Opium Diaries. And we try to explain what we're building or like try to understand the future. Are we building a better future? Are we building a better society or just like replacing the current elite, uh, current people on the top by ourselves? And I think this is exactly what's happening. Whatever mistake of, were made in traditional finance, we replicate the exact same thing in decentralized finance. But then we try to make them cool on, on the public uh, attention. So my point is like, if you look at history, 80s, 90s, 2000s, was massive fights. Google, Microsoft, Microsoft buying or stealing some patents. Apple, like buying some uh, company and turning into Apple, stealing some patents and all stuff, like all the same. There was no open source, but there was like legal fights. Well, right now, there's like, I really like the space because people pretend to build a future and a better world for people, but actually on the ground, they're making merging acquisitions, they're attacking people, they go very bad on uh, lobbying on some different different strategy. So where we are now, it's not like peace. It's a complete war. It's like people are trying to get the biggest shares of the market. And all the different tactics and all the different moves are, are being played right now. Legally or on-chain or acquisitions and also like some stuff going on, like really, really sneaky move. Like, for example, a, a network gets hacked and then suddenly gets acquired or merged. And then all those different things, you know, some stuff is happening in the background. And then the only vision here is to be one of the biggest companies in the world as a conglomerate. So you will soon see in DeFi, company like Alphabet, Facebook, Apple, you will see like five or six different major companies that are not protocol level, but are companies that build across all the different protocols, either financially or outside finance, but that's how that's hundred percent true. It's already happening. And that's what we have all the, mm -hmm. it's not, it's well known that we talk about DeFi drama. Well, when you see someone going online and say, oh, I go off for five, for five days or three days because I, I don't have much enough. It's because stuff is happening in the background. But yeah, we have, I think like in this space, we have like three different people. They play on glory. So a lot of them wants glory over money and over security. And you have this triangle, you know, it's blockchain, transparency, security, and then speed. Well, here's like glory, money, and uh, security. And this is already happening. If you look really at the space and you try to understand, it's what we actually try. It's already happening. Yeah, We have massive actors that are trying to build conglomerates right now. A couple of weeks ago, after the launch of uh, Saddle, which is like a little bit of a clone of Curve, like, you know, they, they, they didn't fork the contracts, but they forked a lot of the uh, ideas of Curve and, you know, but focus more for Bitcoin. We saw that Curve actually had a proposal to like remove all the incentives for TBTC, which is like actually sort of like an unrelated product kind of built by the same company that was building Saddle, but like, you know, sort of as like a punishment for building Saddle almost. And like, do you think this would also, you no, know, do you not think this also classifies as like some sort of like anti-competitive behavior? And well, like I mean, first you got two things inside. I don't think they're correct. First you said Saddle is not a copy, but just change the card. No, it's not true. Saddle is entire copy of Curve, but instead of being in Viper, it's in Solidity. And also, Apparently, they didn't understand the code, so they duplicate curve code, but couldn't actually make it. I mean, didn't fix some bad performance that you could have in in in, in curve, if I if I can say that. And then and then secondly, the, the other point was uh, copyright. And then you said, yeah, the proposal. I don't see I've seen any proposal that can uh, stop because the thing is like it was initiated by the CEO, by the founder, uh, by Matt, by TBTC. But we didn't in curve. We actually didn't go against and stopping incentivizing the pool we didn't do that i mean that's not part of the curve i think curve we like ev everyone i mean it's a fair play if you if you take the code but modify and make it better or something then we'll be okay cool that's uh, that's interesting but no no so there was no proposal to stop incentivizing uh, uh tbtc pool and also the code is also like called a uh, curve curve code but modified in solidity and thirdly 
in, in inside this concept of anti-competitions. I mean, that's interesting. I think that's what that's what exactly what we're building in the entire DeFi. If you think about it, people are focused on money. But I wrote it before, and also it's in the light paper. I think the most interesting interesting bit in this space, and that's what actually people want to have access to. It's not money, it's governance. Because governance control money, governance is power, and that's exactly what's happening in the entire ecosystem. For example, like whatever we pushed in stake stake down, the, the fact that you can delegate curve token, that's just to acquire power of curve. Then, then you can actually play in, in the, for the, the good health of curve, for example. But what you want to do in this space is want to acquire governance because when you have governance, you can interact and you can place your, your, your ships on, on the table. You know what I mean? So what we're planning here, we're playing 4D chess, 100%. So if someone's saying on the ecosystem on Twitter, Oh, this is bad. What's happening here? Oh, no, 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 no. That's actually just someone lying. Because the entire game is actually a 40 chess, even like more in dimension than a 40 chess. And everyone that is playing understand the rules and whatever happened in public happened differently on the ground. And you know, so my, my point, like anti-competitive thing, yeah, 100%. That's what people do, but it's not the goal of curve because curve, curve is underlying, underlying protocol. So curve will accept anyone to build on curve and will push for anyone to build on curve. That's, that's the thing. But then on the top of it, People that are trying to acquire governance and trying to build conglomerate, yeah, obviously they're trying to kill competition, whatever it's a cost, hundred percent. I very much agree with this idea that crypto actually like creates new forms of power, and uh, you know, I think it's Dimitri Kofinas came in this podcast and we talked about this a little bit, and he's been quite vocal on Twitter about this. And what does the world look like when there's a thousand new billionaires and? When those billionaires start, you know, having an enormous amount of power over, over like this DeFi ecosystem, and especially if that DeFi ecosystem starts replacing traditional finance, we want to be sure that like that's what we want as a society. I think that this meme that crypto is like helping the unbanked and creating better opportunities for everyone. I mean, it does. You, you do start on an equal playing field, so like anyone can go out and create Curve or, or Saddle and or, or any kind of DeFi protocol and enormous amounts of power around some liquidity in that protocol. But the time for that to happen is like getting shorter because those actors are starting to really establish their their dominance over the market. And it's going to be very hard to, you know, to like dislodge them. Much like it's very yeah. hard to compete yeah. with Google or Facebook or any other company. Yeah, exactly. And then you're right here. It's like, but what is very dangerous for DeFi is instead of asking the nations or Google or Facebook to answer questions. Here, what we're building in DeFi is just single person that will have as much as power than an entire company such like Google or Facebook or whatever. Of course, like you can say that the protocol is being uh, decentralized and token holders, but most of those people with massive stake in those different protocols will be acting as if they were in traditional finance, a Google or a Facebook or something like that. And it's already happening. Now, if you want to pass some vote in some protocols, you need to talk to those persons. You need to say, okay, please, can you do that? Okay, I can do that. But in exchange, I want you to do that. You know, it's already happening. So lobby, lobby in decentralized finance is controlling decentralized finance. Whatever we're trying to say on the public saying, okay, it gave opportunity for anyone to get involved. It's transparent. Like anyone in Philippines on the middle of nowhere in Africa can actually participate. This is true. But saying that is just like, the way of increasing our bag and controlling more power. So, yeah, if you if someone goes online and say, "Oh, crypto is going to change the world in, the, in a good way uh, and it's going to be perfect," we're building El Dorado and, and all this stuff. As this is complete bullshit. I mean, there's a true. We're building something that is better, but don't say this is perfect world because it's complete bullshit. Whatever we're actually building right now, we're just taking market cap from traditional finance for big entities to get it in, in our pocket on our on the other side. That's exactly what's happening. We're building citadels. You know that this Reddit post about this guy saying the, the reason why Rekt was started as an underground kind of dark style thing is every year I always read two, one or two times this article on Reddit, which I think is beauty because I want to force myself to remind me what I'm actually getting, getting into. This article is I'm from the future and I'm here to tell you that what you're building is bad. And then it explains all those people getting involved in Bitcoin or DeFi are crying a lot of Bitcoin and building those citadels. So if you don't have Bitcoin, you can enter, you cannot enter the citadel. You cannot access to some services. And it's already happening right now. 
But I don't want to be pessimistic. I mean, I think DeFi is fantastic. You should all join. I'd like to ask you what you think the role of validators play in this in this game of 40 chess. And uh, specifically, I mean, what do you think is the risk around validators as a service, such as like Bison Trails and you know, other, other companies like that, effectively controlling not the staking assets themselves, but the infrastructure on which those staking assets are being staked. And, you know, what are the risks of the majority of staking being captured by actors such as this? You have a good example of, of Loom. You know, Loom got was like 60 or 70% at some point controlled by Binance and then completely died. I mean, the reason why this happened is because Binance doesn't give a shit about Loom, but was trying, was actually getting money from Loom. And I mean, this is an example of like most of the staking as a service validator, they don't actually support the vision of decentralization. It's just there as a business model. And the reality is like um, a quick cash, you know, like you make quick, you make cash right now and then you can jump into another opportunity. So it doesn't matter if actually concentration of power goes on chain from those validators as long as they're making money. It's exactly what's happening. And then also a lot of big validators, they have a voting power. So don't believe that someone that has 10 or 15% of voting power in such a network doesn't actually get requests from the outside. Every single day you get requests from the outside, from people saying, I mean, for example, like myself, I'm pretty early in Maker. I have like some voting power in Maker. And then whatever people are trying to make some vote on Maker, they always get back to me and say, hey, Julian, do you mind like doing this? And then I can give you this. It's always happening. And But imagine if you're doing this a higher level. Like validator stuff. I mean, I'm telling things that people don't probably don't want to to say, but uh, uh, this is actually happening. The entire DeFi is not corrupted, but is some really, really stuff happening on the ground and lobby, governance, money being played, big actors asking people to do such things because if they don't do it, then they either not going to integrate their service or they're going to not going to help or they're going to tell people in the auditing firms that please don't audit this project because they don't want to do that. So everything is being played. But the thing is like, actually, it's even bigger than traditional finance. So whatever you see in traditional finance as bad actors, I think we get all of them in in this price, in, in, in decentralized finance, but even bigger because everyone can actually jump in and do whatever they want. So yeah, it's interesting. I mean, also, also the fact that in staking as a service, we all know each other. I mean, I know you guys. I know, the, I know Sunny. I know everyone. We all do staking as a service. So every time there's a new network that wants to get some staking as a service, we create a Telegram group and we get all together and we talk. We talk. This is already happening. There's a few different validators in the world that will provide good services and you want them on board. That's it. That's how it is. And then we charge a commission and we charge money and we make money. That's it. Perhaps one more question, which is like slightly related to this. It's it's a little bit off topic, but I, I, since I have you know two people that run validators uh, here on in front of me, I'd like to ask both of you. Perhaps, where do you think like staking as a service providers? So I'm thinking like Sika, Chorus One, like these types types of companies that are effectively as, acting as delegators and validators as a service, like the Bison Trails, etc. Do you see one merging into the other, or do you think that they'll continue to have like separate roles in the space moving forward? Like, do you think staking as a service providers will become validators as a service, or you know, is it the other way around, or do they like continue to live separately for eternity? Didn't didn't Trail of, of Beats got acquired by Coinbase? Yes, they did. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, not surprising. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the last thing they they have left for staking as a service is their reputations. They're getting a delegation from a businesses or from big VC or hedge fund. And those big VC and hedge fund, I mean, they won't, they won't ask questions. I mean, Charles of Bits is really like a business for providing the service, making a lot of money. On the other side, staking out the service that were bootstrapped in 2017, maybe 2000. Yeah. We were like back then sunny, like getting like, that was pretty new, new market. I was like, just like two or three different actors. I remember like, I was like, Certus, Tech Capital, uh, Sunny with, on the, on the Cosmos side, like a few of them. I think for our side, we have a reputation to, to maintain, I would say. But yeah, I've seen a lot of violators, uh, moving into uh, money grab and, and cash, like not having like any question regardless the, uh, if the, the, the chain they were getting involved into was actually, uh, legit or providing any utility. As long as you get a percentage of the, 
of the market cap and you get commission and you're making money, then those guys, they will just provide services. So it's not about most of those people are not about the vision. It's just about, I mean, we have to, we have to understand that those providing staking as a service or any, any services in DeFi costs money. Most of them, we're running AWS servers, uh, Google and the staff. So when you have a team and you have a legal entity and you need to pay, then you just go for the money and you pay the team and then that's it. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to agree. I mean, I think that, you know, at least for Sika, our, our, I mean, our goal has always been to focus more on like few networks that we can be like active governance participants in. And, you know, I think there are entities whose goal is to focus on just like scaling up and like being just running at everything possible. But that's, I, I think there'll be niches for both of them. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm like, like Julian mentioned, I think that the, uh, the ones who do want to scale up to everything possible will probably be the ones that make more money on that. But, you know, I, I feel for us at least, you know, making money off the validator was never really the goal. I mean, we, that's, if it was, we'd be running on way more networks than we are right now. So yeah, I think, I think it'll, it just depends on. The yeah. Network. But I mean, yourself, yourself, Sonny, it's, a, it's interesting how you, how you started is like, you really want against the, the validators, but want for the users, meaning that you started taking the service as 0% commission fee, acquire a lot of users, got up to millions of users dollar asset under management. And then turn into a fees mechanism, which, mm-hmm. which is interesting because it was a completely different business model compared to the other validators. And then you got the entire validators saying, this is not fair, you were saying. And you were saying, oh, but I'm doing this for the experiment of governance, testing some new governance model. And then I think it's, it won't success uh, as a success. I mean, in, in, the, in the past three years, the entire ecosystem completely changed. It's, it's like, a day in DeFi is like it's a, it's a year in traditional in traditional finance. But yeah, we've seen a lot of different staking as a service dying because they were not actually focused on making money. And then the ones that were focused on making money, now they are super powerful. So it's like it's always the same, you know, like people that actually, I mean, we've seen a lot of people that were there just for the vision. And they were like, no, 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 no I don't mind. I just provide the validator. But then they end up like paying a lot of a large cost in, in, in those uh, AWS, in those cloud services that they have to stop and then we don't see them anymore. Yeah, that makes sense. To bring it back to, you know, some of the last couple of DeFi stuff we wanted to talk about, one of the things that like with Rect is about like, you know, how the average user is not basically constantly being adversely selected against. Um, and, and, you know, I feel like you guys have actually done a good job of like creating a lot of like meme around this with like the whole aping in and like, do you think, do you think Rect has been, do, like, you know, helping foster a culture of DGEN DeFi or do you think it's meant or it's been like doing a lot to like help protect the average users? Yeah, I think it's on both sides. It's, uh, I mean, also if you've seen the, I think how we start, we started uh, Rect was by this uh, sticker, the, the death. I mean, the, the culture of Rect is really Fitting this kind of like DJing, hacking, and it's black and white on the ground. We send, if someone gets wrecked really bad, like suffering on the ground, suffocating, then we send these very bad stickers. And there is this vibe about this, this movement of like on the ground, uh, hikers and all this stuff. But I, I think it's on the other side, if you really spend time on wrecked, mm-hmm. read all the wrecked information. Then you will have a good understanding of whatever is happening in DeFi and also a good way to defend or to protect yourself against different attacks or different exploits that are possible. Either they overcall exploits, flash loans. We really deeply go inside the protocol and explain those different interactions. We spend hours and hours. Every time there is something happening, we investigate. We usually the first one to deliver the news, but not deliver something because people expect us to deliver. Because we actually 100% sure that the information we provide to the users is correct, is pertinent, and is very well, well researched, uh, and well explained. That's what we do. I'm also working on like some, like a little book for wrecked hackers, like meaning like how to, how to basically as a normal user, I mean, a little bit of experience with coding, how you can actually replicate all those different hacks, how you can plug and play those different exploits and all this stuff. Meaning that if you provide this, the space will be more secured. How do you educate users? Like, you know, you know, we talked about like 
mostly about like the technical and mechanism design exploits. But what about like a lot of these like social exploits and the rug pulls and all these things? How do we like, you know, make sure the average users are educated uh, in how to make good decisions on, you know, as much as we want to think this is trustless and everything, it seems that there seems to be a lot of trust required to interact with most of these systems. So how do we educate people to know who to trust and how to make those decisions? But the problem, I don't think it's possible. I mean, I don't want to say that. I, I'm saying like, it, it's difficult to tell people, please don't get involved in this network if this or this project, if this project is providing 200% APY or something. I mean, intrinsically speaking, people and humans are just like, we'll do everything possible and we will just believe in some stuff that is making money. So explaining them that if whatever you're doing is bad, then they will not understand. And the thing is more about the incentives. We need to provide tools or uh, analytics and metrics and different systems that can tell them this is red flag. Please don't invest. Please don't participate. Please don't ape. But the problem is like this aping vibe or on Twitter, people saying, oh, I put 100 bucks in this very famous builder and then I got a million US dollars and then people will just share. So then the next time, as soon as there's a new network like that, people will just try the chance and it will invest as well. So yeah, the, the, I don't think I was having like an argument with someone from uh, regulation a couple days ago and they were saying that DeFi is more dangerous than uh, this, uh, start traditional finance. I don't think so. I think it's actually safer, but the problem is because it's more accessible to people. Anyone in the world can jump very quick just by a mobile wallet and put some money. So we talk in a range of people getting access to DeFi is actually bigger. I mean, f- uh, not bigger, but faster and people without actually any understanding because not having digging into the information before are actually subject to get badly wrecked by, by, by those different protocols. I think you need to follow the people behind the project. You need to ask questions on the telegram and you need to, I mean, on the, on the different channels and also like listen to, uh, to you guys. Like you guys are more like uh, providing good. A good example of education in this space that have been there for a reasonable amount of time. So I think if people want to join a project, they first need to look at AP Center or other people that are providing educational courses that seeing that if those guys actually got interviewed on those different media channels. Yeah. So don't trust very far and don't try to hide because you, you're saying that you can make. And, and also, I mean, I'm, I feel like devil advocate here, but I think if people get wrecked by aping, I think they deserve it. To be honest. So, what is uh, your DGen score, by the way? You know, you, did you see the uh, Atomic Blue DGen scores? What is yours? Man, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm the, I don't, want, I don't want to dox. I mean, can, can you actually see on chain information? I don't want to dox myself, but yeah, I'm pretty, pretty good there on DGen well, score. I mean, I would say you, top ten, but uh, yeah, pretty good. So you're obviously clearly a master DGen, and you know, I think. You know, you're working on all these different projects and, you know, there's ways to get exposure to like, you know, all the cool work you're doing on all of them. You know, you can, there's the stake DAO token, there's the curve token. Uh, you know, I've heard that there's a wrecked DAO coming eventually. What is this Julian token? You know, is this going to be some basket of ev- all things Julian? Yeah, this is exactly. I mean, I think like, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an investor in world, the social token system, and I feel like, I'm not, I don't have Instagram. I don't have Facebook. I don't have all these different tools, but I, I do believe that, I mean, most of the people worldwide, 99% of the entire uh, people worldwide, they use those systems and the retail is big fan of those systems. So I believe that social tokens will be a major, uh, ma- will take a major market cap in, in the near future in crypto. So then I, I invest and then I create this, um, from this platform. So I don't like people saying I create a token. I mean, I just click on the button and then the token got, you know, it's just like, it's like, it's, it's funny. But, and then I was like, okay, I need to find, I need to find utility behind this token. And that's why I actually start distributing air, like, I, I thought that was funny, but I actually airdrop more, more than hundred ledgers. And by giving away ledger to people that add Julian token, then I got fucked by ledger company with, uh, <laughs> by the exploits. I think that was pretty funny. But uh, mm-hmm. my entire flat got made by some guys, random guys in London and all this stuff. I mean, that was like pretty, uh, that was a pretty bad experience. But my point, then I started doing this, offering free class 
in Viper and, and auditing and exploit. So people that had at least 100 GN token could have access with me or Anna, and I will go deeply into the code, like how to start a Web3 project, run like auditing on the code, like basically driving those users into how to build a, a, a Web3 project. And mm -hmm. so I did, I did also classes on, on a Go, Rust, um, a JavaScript, and also like a little bit of C++. So I really went into class system, but it takes time. So I was doing it between 2 and 3 uh, and two p.m. And, and 3 p.m. And then I was like, wait wait a second. How can I basically, whatever I'm building, give a chance to the people that have access to this to policy base? So in Stack DAO, I distribute. I think that was probably like um, 8 million US dollars uh, from the Stack DAO. Same in uh, other projects. So if Rec DAO is going live, if Blackpool is going live, if State Capital is a, because State Capital is actually turning, not turning, it's actually operational, uh, as a quant, quantitative aging, uh, quantitative firm. So like trading market maker liquidation, arbitrage, and then like really intense into mathematics in the flow of developers. Think about State Capital as 0.0001% or whatever Alameda SBF is doing, because this guy is too big, uh, right now. But, um, yeah, so that's it. So this is what I do. So whatever I'm, every project that I'm starting, I will give to those guys uh, free um, free shares or free governance shares of those projects. Then I was thinking about how can I give 1% of all my investments inside this bucket of people that have been um, either trusting me or, or following me. I mean, not following, but like investing in, in this token. But I think for legal reasons, it's, it's probably not possible right now. But yeah, this is stuff that I'm looking for, like rewards, also like uh, liquidations. So, for example, like what happened two days ago, or yesterday, like uh, some those kind of like very bear market things. When I make a lot of a lot of I call them rewards on liquidations, then I will distribute a portion to those people. Cool. Well, that's been really awesome. Um, so, what is the best place for people to you know follow you and all these projects that you're working on? Um, on Twitter, uh, it's my at B Nelish. And what it is basically my, my name reversed. So B is for Butulu and then Julian. So it's B Julian opposite. Um, yeah, they can, yeah, and text me on, on Twitter, on Telegram. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit it took me like at least a year to realize that that, that your handle is just your name backwards. But <laughs> handle is just your name backwards. Man, you, you're the one. You're the one behind like Tinder Mint uh, protocol, and you cannot like solve this little <laughs> puzzle. <laughs> awesome! Thank you for coming on. No, thank you. Thank you for having me, guys. You guys are really rock, and I really recommend your your podcast to anyone that wants to understand uh, this space because you guys have been providing a huge value to people. Thanks. That, that means a lot coming from you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>